Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start you off with a composite map of the mid-level flow of the atmosphere so far through the month of August, because this is a map that's going to change a lot over the next uh, 10 days or so. What we've favored in this pattern is a deeper trough of low pressure here. And I made a case for the last few weeks that this is really what's dominated the pattern. So this low pressure center in the Bering Sea has driven the jet stream south of it here. It's run up over a large ridge over the west, which at times has even had a little cutoff low that's been over parts of uh, just off the coast of Southern California. But it's then allowed the jet stream to dive into the middle part of the United States. We've had a ridge that's built over Texas, a deep trough over New England, and it's just been, for the most part, stuck like this. And what this particular pattern has done is this, okay? So month to date temperature ranks by climate district. We are setting all time records along our Gulf Coast and into Texas in terms of how hot this August has been. It's been extremely hot up in the Pacific Northwest and throughout California in the Southwest. Month of August, really no incidence of, of heat. In fact, we've got a lot of cool air still sitting in the midsection of the United States, all right? So what's gonna change with this, first of all, is gonna be the ridge pattern that has been stuck in Texas. It's gonna to start to open up and flex its way into the midsection of the country. The only reason why that's gonna happen is this is gone. This upstream feature is out. So that's gonna change our precipitation patterns as well. And this is just an amazing map to look at because month to date, total precipitation ranks by climate district just shows you how wet it has been from parts of the Northern Plains through the central US down here into the mid south and pockets of the Corn Belt as well. And as you just kind of get a good look at this map, it shows you just the disparity in, in rainfall amounts when you just compare, especially parts of the Mid-South here to what's going on in parts of Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. I made a case all year long that I didn't think we'd have much of an, a southwestern monsoon, and that case is starting to uh, kind of fail as a forecast, not because we're getting full true monsoonal flow, but because a few other factors are starting to, to influence this. We're going to have an area that's going to go hotter and much drier here. We're going to continue to stay hot and dry to the south, except for the potential for some tropical activity coming into Texas. And the changes we're seeing out here in the East Pacific, I think, are really going to be driving a lot of the weather patterns along the West Coast. we got to get in here and talk about this. So one other factor to kind of bring up here before we dig into this. Uh, this is a cumulative downward solar flux map. And I show this map every once in a while, but it looks at how much of the sun's light gets all the way down to the surface. And you can see a couple of interesting things. This whole region in through here that has these colors that show up on the negative side of the color bar represent where there's been just a lot of excess cloud. Okay, I was watching this all summer long to see if the Canadian wildfire smoke would affect it, and it really didn't. But now we're starting to see the effects of that over the last month. Not the wildfire smoke, but the increase in cloud cover due to precipitation. So just another way of looking at it, but it'll be, uh, I think, the last time we see a map that looks something like this where we're really, you know, dry, or excuse me, really, really wet in the midsection of the country. We have one more frontal boundary that's going to drive into this part of the country, increasing the risk of strong to severe storms here. But after that, these, uh, you know, wet, very wet episodes in the midsection of the country are going to take a bit of a break as a pretty sizable ridge moves in. Now, that's only part of the story that we're going to be talking about, because where we're going to see the major increases could be down south and could be, I think, more likely be down here in the southwest. And that's because of this. This is an animation. You're kind of looking at half of, you know, of the northern, or you're looking at the northern hemisphere, but kind of half the planet uh, in the northern hemisphere at uh, near, excuse me, a long wave infrared radiation. So this is, um, you know, an IR satellite image. And it's kind of funny, I know, but when you look at the colors, uh, the warm colors actually represent very, very cold cloud tops. I don't know why we do it that way, but we do. So we have Fernanda, for example, over here. We're watching tropical activity coming off of Africa here. And again, the beauty of using infrared is you can use it at night. And so I've got just a good loop here uh, over the last 12 hours or so showing you a lot of the activity we're talking about. Now, Fernanda is going off toward uh, the west, but it's this large convective plume, watch it again right here, that's got a lot of our attention. And we talked about it the last several days here about where this could potentially go. Because as that huge ridge builds into the midsection of the country, which is going to be right here, replacing these lows like the one you're watching going out, that's going to start to increase the chances that something coming out of the East Pacific gets pulled toward California. This also improves the chances that anything that sits here in the Gulf of Mexico gets pulled towards Texas. So we need to be having a discussion about that. So right now, we've only got the early morning update from uh, the National Hurricane Center. They'll do another one about 8 a.m. Eastern Time. And if we look at the seven-day forecast, they've got a few different areas that they're now watching carefully. Excuse me, it's now the 2 a.m. update. 
So this wave here, the lead wave in the Atlantic, 40% chance of developing the one following 30%. The Bermuda High is sitting currently right in this area, which is going to pull these in this direction. But we've been talking the last couple of days about what could be coming out of, of Texas. Now, at this point, I'm not yet seeing evidence of just like a, a hurricane. I'm just seeing evidence of tropical thunderstorms, a tropical low pressure center coming out of this area that could move quickly westward and get into Texas. So here we go. Let's kind of break this all down. Actually, I'm going to start back over here in the Atlantic. So remember, this next animation you're going to watch here shows us where the European model and its ensemble members are attempting to produce tropical areas of low pressure. That's it. These are not hurricane tracks right now. These are just areas of tropical low pressure. And we see this one right here as the one I want to watch first. It is the potential for there to be, finally, something brewing in the Gulf of Mexico that could uh, make its way toward uh, Texas and deliver the chances, better chances for seeing some rainfall. Now, the operational runs, which are the stuff that gets posted on Facebook and you know on Twitter that show these wild you know end-of-run uh, scenarios where there's massive hurricanes, please be very careful in consuming that information because uh, that always happens in the models. The models tend to go toward high-amplitude events as you get out longer in the forecast. That's why we use the ensemble here. But this is just showing us that activity is increasing, and therefore we're going to have to pay very close attention. Your best resource is always going to be the National Hurricane Center. Now from here, let's go back to the East Pacific and talk about the events that we really need to be paying attention to. Fernanda, just to give you a quick update, is expected to continue to weaken as it moves toward Hawaii, which is here. All right, But behind it is this wave currently given a 90% uh, percent chance of developing. That one is the one that I want to watch carefully because of its interaction with the ridge that's moving into the Midwestern United, uh, United States. So this is what you need to see. Okay, While Fernanda moves off, whatever follows it here is likely going to be pulled to the north. Now, people in Southern California, you've probably been bombarded with images of what looks like massive hurricane uh, hitting LA. Please be very careful in consuming that. What we're just watching right now is the potential for whatever develops here to move toward the north. Now, it's important to understand that the, um, the, the ocean temperatures just off of California are not supportive of a massive hurricane. But we could get the remnants of this delivering moisture into the area. And that's usually what the discussion is about. And yes, you could get a circulation, but it's, you know, we have to be very tempered in our understanding and, and prediction of what this could potentially be here. So I do want to show you a couple of different model runs. Uh, this is just kind of a more static image. This one here uh, is coming from, in fact, let's start off with the uh, ECMWF. There we go. We can see where the potential tracks are taking this would-be developing system, which means we need to be on the you know, having the discussion at least about what this could mean in terms of moisture coming into this area. The GFS ensemble has actually given a very similar outlook, as you can tell here, pulling the moisture from this system through and toward the Baja and then eventually to California. So what's helping this all along and what does it all mean? Well, this is the same map I showed you yesterday. We're looking at the upper level height pattern, but we're looking at this in terms of standard deviation. So as I play this forward, that's the last trough. There it is. That's the last one that dips through by Thursday into the Great Lakes because we've lost the deeper trough of low pressure over the Aleutian Islands. So what happens is this significant ridge, and I do mean significant because we're starting to see some parts of this ridge in the central plains get up here to be almost four standard deviations above average, while the what is the low that is currently sitting off of Mexico begins to push its way toward the north. Now just remember how the circulation works with this. What we have here is a large area of high pressure, clockwise flow, and we also have this, which is an area of low pressure, which has got some counterclockwise flow. All around it, we have these other kind of saddle points in the flow, which means that this system has a really good chance of making its way toward the north. And with it, it's going to take some of its moisture. Now, the ensembles by next Monday are pulling that within, you know, reasonably close proximity to California, while this larger ridge just sits in the midsection of the country through Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Then we see after this low pressure developing right here, and this is going to be the next system we're going to keep an eye on, because as you note, the ridge sitting in this place, what happens to the south of it? It pulls anything that's in the Gulf of Mexico over here towards Texas. Now, before we get into this system, I do want to show you that the latest update here from the European model, looking at where the, the moisture and momentum from this system could get pulled, we see that it, it could still maintain a circulation just off the California coast. But take a look at this. 
on this side of it, we could possibly be bringing in just some very strong flow with plenty of moisture through Mexico into the southwestern United States. So it's always a question as to how much moisture that could possibly have in it. So I'm going to show you an operational run now. So we understand this is not an ensemble. I'll show you that next. But what we're going to see here over the next 10 days in terms of total precipitation is this. Okay, let's stop it right there. Our last low cuts through here later this week, increasing the chances of storms today and tomorrow going over the Great Lakes. That's what you saw right here. We have a stalled out frontal boundary. Remember sitting here along our, our Gulf Coast. In fact, it's going to be just off of the East Coast and Gulf Coast here, keeping storms active in Florida. As we then play this forward, the rain is done in this area once we get past this last frontal boundary that sneaks through here. Now, what you're going to watch is these tropical systems begin to move. So there's the first one, the one we talked about in the East Pacific. And you can see that it is possibly delivering quite a bit of moisture farther and farther to the north. You then start to see the operational models pull something in off of Florida towards Louisiana and Texas, possibly delivering some of the first rainfall in this area in more than 50 days. So that will be, this will be the two main tropical features that we're going to keep a very close eye on. Now remember, this is a single operational run, and I'm all the way out here at day 10. So to see something like this, just be aware uh, that what you're seeing here is, is the end of a model run. So we, we don't often give these much uh, you know, credit. But what I do want to point out is what's going to be happening throughout the Canadian Prairie. Now, we mentioned earlier in the week that we we're going to see ring of fire storms out of this, improving this area. So while we're going to be on the lookout for very heavy rains in parts of the southwest and up the west coast, look at this area here, because this is an area that desperately needs moisture. So are the ensembles in agreement with this? Well, certainly throughout the Canadian Prairie, the probability over the next 10 days of grabbing an inch are high. We've got better than a 50% chance, and in some places up here north of Highway 16, you know, better than a 90% chance. But do you see this? This is where that moisture is beginning to push its way into Texas later on in the forecast, all right? This is where the moisture is coming up from the would-be tropical system developing off the coast of Mexico. So these probabilities are really beginning to increase. Now, who's drier in this pattern? Well, it's the central part of the country under the ridge. And this is the chance of getting a half inch of rainfall, uh, or less than a half inch of rainfall in the next 10 days. And this is the chance of getting less than a tenth. So extremely dry in the center of that ridge. Now, I want to go back to one other thing, though, the moisture on the northern side of this, because the Canadian prairie has been exceptionally dry for the last 60 days. There's been better storms in parts of Alberta and way over here in southeastern parts of, um, of uh, Manitoba getting into Ontario. But we've largely missed a big area here where there's still places that in the last two months have received well less than half of normal rainfall. Well, with the increased chances in precipitation, it'll be interesting to watch how the NDVI imagery changes. So I'm going to link this in the notes below. It's just a site I use all the time, but I want to show you some new data from it. So first of all, when you get here, let's kind of zoom in on North America. You can go anywhere in the world you want with this, but let's zoom in on North America. What I then want you to do is you can click on admin level one, which gives you states or Canadian provinces, or you can click on admin level two, which will give you like county level information. Now I'm doing that so that I can include very specific areas when I click on uh, the map. So I'm just curious about the southern part of Saskatchewan or the southeastern corner of um, you know, Alberta. And let's get over here into the southwestern part of Manitoba. Sorry, I'm kind of clicking on these. Whoops, grabbed one in North Dakota. Doesn't matter. Let's just leave it there. The point is to show you that this region right now, NDVI values are near the lowest part of the 20-year distribution. And this has been devastating to the crops in this area without rainfall. And we're going to start to see this really begin to improve with the rainfall that is, that is coming. So I just wanted to show you how to use this tool to get down there to this kind of county level view uh, so you can have a good look at this data. Now from here, let's go take a look at where the pattern should be about 10 days from now. And we've noticed that the models which are opening up a large ridge into this area over the next week are expecting to see that ridge retrograde, which means pull back to the west, setting up right here once we get out there to about the 26th of August. So that means the flow ends up doing something like this over the top of it, redeveloping a deeper trough in this area. So if we do that, we'll have to watch what the precipitation pattern, pattern does, but you can start to see how you end up getting those ridge riding storms diving right back through parts of the upper Midwest and Great Lakes pulling into New England. And the models are beginning to reflect that. The week two pattern, well, the CPC backed off on the week two extent of the dryness here. European models now beginning to show more of a stormy pattern around the northern edge of this, coming out of the Rocky Mountains into the northern edge. And I do want to point out 
that the week two, so again, this is day eight through 14, is now showing better rains coming into Texas from the flow around the bottom side of that ridge here. So this is the area we're gonna watch carefully for any tropical development. Meanwhile, the west continues to stay extremely stormy during this pattern, while that ridge opens and slowly moves back to the west. So that's gonna be the mainstay of the pattern through almost the end of August here. Okay, next, I wanna show you some satellite data from yesterday. So this was the last low that we saw coming through here. There's one more that's gonna sneak up here into parts of the upper Midwest, but this is the last one to really dive into the Midwest. Big storms in the southeast from this yesterday. Look at that, convection popping here. But what I wanted to see was the wildfire smoke that was in the uh, western United States because you can really see the smoke spreading here from the big fires that are in parts of Oregon, but they're also here in the northern Rockies and the Cascades. And we also have some of them up here in British Columbia. I did notice too, it seems as though there were, I'm not sure if these were controlled burns or not, but you can see some fires coming out of Kansas into Oklahoma uh, as well. Okay, where's that wildfire smoke expected to go? Well, this is an animation just over the next 48 hours. And we can see our last trough of low pressure. See it diving in there? So the smoke will get pulled to the south of it. But after that guy's done, remember, we're gonna start to see a big ridge open, which means some of that smoke will get pulled back up into the Canadian prairie out of the Pacific Northwest. Now, I put off to the very end of this to talk to you about the temperatures because this map is gonna change a lot over the next seven to 10 days. It's our all hazards weather map We've now, for the first time in a very long time, not had excessive heat watches and warnings over a large part of the south. The excessive heat watches and warnings and advisories in the northwest are only got a few more days to last, and we're going to see these colors really rebuild into the midsection of the United States. So I'm going to first show you the National Digital Forecast Database. Sorry, I was a little ahead of you here. This is today on Thursday, or excuse me, Wednesday. So one more pulse of cooler air right there on Thursday heat back into Texas, excessive heat in the Pacific Northwest through California into the Southwest. Then we get into Friday. This is the beginning of the end of the hot weather here. It builds into the midsection of the country. By Saturday, we're gonna be watching triple digit heat in the midsection of the country. That's wave number one. Then you're gonna see Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, much cooler air, cloud cover driven coming into the Southwest and into the Intermountain West while we see repeated days deep in the 90s with uh, some a lot of places here getting well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I just wanna, again, point out something. You're gonna see a lot of the images put out on social media about how hot it's gonna be. Many of them will show you what's called the parent temperature, not the actual temperature, but the apparent temperature. This is like the heat index. And so when we do look out there, some of the forecast models, because there's you know such heat and moisture already in the soil from the recent rainfall, the humidity is gonna be high initially with this. So what we'll see here is the near surface humidity combining with that heat to give us an apparent temperature or heat index like we're gonna see here on Saturday that will easily get up well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Like I said, two big pulses of this heat. We're gonna see again on Monday and Tuesday the possibility here in the Midwest and uh, Northern Plains to see the high temperature, the apparent high temperature getting up there possibly above 110. So there is some substantial heat coming into this area. Now with that, I need to show you something here. Latest stress degree day map. Where do I have that one? There it is. This is the accumulation of degrees above 86, right? And we know that for this part of the country, when you get above 140, we start to see uh, yield loss in corn. That was a study based out of Iowa. We're going to see this line demarc uh, demarcating the different or the boundary between uh, the green and the red, which indicates where you have been above 140 and where you're not, this is going to move its way to the north with this heat that's coming in. So I wanted to make that uh, that point here. But how long is the heat going to last? So let's finish it up with that. What you've got here is the next five days. That's as the heat builds in. Day five through 10 is where we're just scorched in this area, but a lot of cloud cover and rainfall from the, you know, the pull of moisture off of that tropical system keeps the southwest cool. But we've seen the models back off that ridge. So if it backs off, you know, we would expect to see cooler weather coming back into New England and the Great Lakes and possibly getting parts of the Corn Belt here. That suppresses the heat back into the Central Plains and South. And this is what I think the pattern will do. I don't think we've got more than about seven to 10 days of excessive heat in the midsection of the country before the pattern begins to evolve a bit. Now, one last thing, speaking of temperatures, the global ocean temperature pattern continues to give us an El Nino that develops. 
this is going to give us two very different months for September across the United States compared to October. I'm expecting more of September to have a lot of warmth throughout most of the U.S. I'm expecting it to be active in terms of the hurricane season, which is why predicting the precipitation for September is going to be hard. But there is some evidence that once we get into October, our good first full month of fall, we're going to watch for possible, possibly having cooler conditions get into this area. And uh, that's an important time period because it's a time period of, of normal first frosts, for example, in the Midwest. So we'll just keep an eye on that pattern change. But that's largely being driven by this um, El Nino event. But the ocean temperatures in the Atlantic, I just want to make one more point here about how supportive they are of, of, um, you know, of, of tropical activity. So I want to take you to this site. I told you in the past, it's one of my favorites. Levi Cowan runs this. He's brilliant. Go listen to what the kid has to say. He's not a kid anymore, sorry, but he's just brilliant young scientist. Okay, you can click across the top anything you want up here, but I'm going to take you today to the analysis tools, okay? When you come here, you can click on any of these, but I like the ocean analysis uh, particular uh, uh, site here. First of all, I just want to point out that right now in our El Nino region, Nino region 3.4 in the middle of the Pacific, we're above a degree C. We expect this to actually grab a full degree Celsius above this in the coming four months. But what I want you to do is come over here to this map, choose a different region. I want to pick right now the Western Atlantic and blow this up for you because it's just to show you why we're so concerned about this part of the Gulf of Mexico. 32 degrees Celsius is 91 Fahrenheit. And what you see here is modeled ocean temperatures that are averaging above 90 degrees Fahrenheit across a broad section uh, of the uh, tropical uh, Atlantic and getting into the, the Gulf of Mexico. So this just continues to be front of mind for us as we play, play forward here. One last thing, we uh, are less than a month away from when they start planting in South America, which is going to mean that the arrival of South American monsoon is going to be incredibly important uh, to figure out where that pattern is going to go. And we'll keep you updated on that soon. So please uh, just stay tuned to this and we'll watch it together and see how the pattern evolves. Have a good one. Thanks.